بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين I would like to welcome everybody tonight to this scientific uh, meeting and I would like to uh, welcome our first speaker tonight uh, Professor Hassan Abdi Jabbar is a well-known and senior professor of obstetric and gynecology at King Abdul Aziz uh, University Hospital uh, he's done a lot of a lot of work in the development of the science of uh, obstetric and, uh, and gynecology in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, being uh, a teacher in the university and, uh, and an, an expert clinician. Um, he will address you on the topic of polycystic uh, ovary disease. Uh, please, the Prof. Hassan. Hassan. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Awalan ashkur al-lejna al-munadzima ala hada al-muqtamar. Inshallah tukun sahra mumti'a, sahra ilmiya mumti'a. Wa ashkur jami'a al-society illi mushtarika ma'ana fi hada al-muqtamar. Wa بصفة رئيس الجمعية السعودية لأمراض النساء والولادة تقدم للجميع بالشكر لجميع السبيكر واختياري لهذا الموضوع حنتكلم عن polycystic ovarian syndrome polycystic ovarian syndrome and I usually put this picture بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أشكر اللجنة المنظمة على اختياري لهذا الموضوع الموضوع المهم جدا في الواقع اللي هو polycystic ovarian syndrome هنتكلم عن ال diagnosis ويمكن شوية كمان عن ال management the new management and what what we should do with those patients I always put this slide just to remind people that how bad the girl would look like if she had a, if she had hirsutism, and how bad for us to see an ovary which is enlarged, and how bad by ultrasound you see multiple follicles. And if you have all these three, you would know that you are dealing with uh, uh, a disease. This disease was described. Uh, First, by Stein Leventhal syndrome, Stein and Leventhal syndrome, Erwin Stein and Michael Leventhal, they put a triad of diseases, which is amenorrhea, obesity, and hirsutism. In the and the, it is one of the most common endocrinological disorder in women in reproductive. Uh, it used to be 2 to 8 percent, but now with the advance in making the diagnosis, the, uh, the disease is much more than 8 percent. Rotatum criteria, they said uh, two out of the three, you will end by making the diagnosis. And there is no single criteria sufficient for clinical diagnosis. But if you have anovulation, if you have polycystic ovary in ultrasound, and if you have uh, an element of hyperandrogenism, you know that you are dealing with uh, something called polycystic ovary. It's very difficult to diagnose. Uh, usually, uh, we diagnose it or the patient would come to us because of a few things. Number one is infertility, and we see them all the time in infertility. She might have a major problem with her period, but she never seeks uh, medical advice. But when she, when it comes to infertility, she wanted to have a baby, she would come and ask why I didn't get pregnant. Excessive hair growth, and this is a major problem for young, young age. You know now, uh, beauty is important. People, they do surgery for beauty, and they uh, do Botox and fillers, and if I imagine somebody who has a hair growth in her beard, uh, this is what, what make her come to the, to, the, to the hospital. 
Abnormal and irregular vaginal bleeding is one of the commonest uh, presentation. Of course, obesity and acne, this is becoming very extensive because we have a major, a major issue and maybe the endocrinologists, they know that we have a lot of uh, obese patients and we know that uh, uh, a major uh, treatment, whether medical or surgical, been addressed to, to, to obesity, to reduce the obesity, especially in uh, this part of the world. Uh, hair loss, a very extensive hair loss sometimes make the people, they come. And you imagine if you have a, an 18 or 19 year old girl with uh, hair like this, she would not accept her face. She would not accept her, her, herself in the mirror. She, the people around her, they would not accept her. Uh, infertility, as I mentioned, is one of the most common uh, presenting factors. And look at the acne. The people, they present with acne, overweight, uh, a little bit of hair loss, and irregular vaginal bleeding. By ultrasound, uh, and this is an important, normal ovary can show you some follicles, one or two, three follicles, but that doesn't mean this patient have polycystic ovarian disease. But when you come to the ultrasound with multiple follicles, and in the criteria, they say you have to have at least 12 follicles to call it uh, uh, polycystic. And usually it's uh, surrounded ovary, surround the ovary. It's, uh, it's uh, outside the ovary, uh, in, the, in, the, in the outside, not inside the ovary. Usually they are, look like the same. They are the same in, 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 in size. And important to not to, not to, confused between a normal ovary and a polycystic ovary by ultrasound. We have a genetic predisposition to this medication, to this uh, disease, aging, pregnancy, drug lifestyle is very important uh, in making the, it has insulin resistance, it's hyperinsulinemia, it alters steroid hormone metabolism. Uh, it can alter even uh, fat metabolism, increase the lipid uh, and android hormones. Insulin resistance has uh, repeatedly increased in the last decade, and this is maybe a pediatric endocrinologist started to do more tests earlier than, than before, uh, than, 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 than the hormone can restore menses in 50% to 60% of patients with BCO. Oral contraceptive have been shown to be superior to metformin for regular menses. And there is no study to demonstrate the superiority of one contraceptive over the other. All of them the same. Not only oral contraceptive, even uh, uh, the patches, the vaginal ring. Once you are, you have hormone to suppress the ovary. You are uh, targeting the, the your your uh, your mission. How can we prevent endometrial hyperplasia in this patient? They have to have a period. They have to have a period. The problem is sometimes people they don't want to take contraceptives, and they don't have a period, and then they have high estrogen level in their body. And there is no period, no progesterone. You have to give them one of the progesterone derivatives uh, uh, containing, uh, which contain the same as containing contraceptives if they don't want to take contraceptive. Sometime in elderly age group, maybe we would uh, Marina, which is uh, an IUCD containing progesterone to give them an element of progesterone that will prevent endometrial hyperplasia. Patient comfort and preference should be accounted and you should discuss the patient with the patient what she wants to have. Hirsutism, which is an important for young age group, we said, uh, of course, for age group, but the, in the young age group, they come immediately once they have uh, hirsutism uh, troubled them. And hyperandrogenism manifestation of BCO require at least six months of treatment. You cannot give her the medication in which she expect her to have a, a, no hirsutism after one week or two weeks, at least six months. And in Cochrane's study review, the most effective line of treatment, again, is oral contraceptives. A spironolactone in a dose of 25 to 100 milligram daily 
can uh, can help uh, in conjunction with oral contraceptive. There is a lot of medications uh, now in the market to decrease androgen, but these are the most common uh, used by the by the uh, gynecologist. Other therapies uh, including electrolysis and laser and intense pulse light uh, therapy, all these can help to remove this, the hair and give them a better, uh, a better uh, uh, picture. Acne, uh, the acne usually seen by the dermatologist, but sometimes people, they come, they say, go to the, your gynecologist to see the hormone. And when you come to, is in general population and in patient with BCO, definitely is more common in patient with BCO. Hormonal contraceptive is the first line of treatment. The second line of treatment is the <coughs> topical, which can be used by the dermatology. Monotherapy is important in those patients, especially uh, if you are using uh, one of those antibiotic or retinoid cream or whatever uh, cream they are using. Anti-android like spironolactone is the most common added line of treatment for patients with uh, hirsutism uh, for acne. Uh, we come to uh, what, uh, what is the problem with BCO in pregnancy? It can cause uh, spontaneous abortion. Although they, are get, they get pregnant, but sometimes they have a higher incidence of maybe because of BMI, maybe because of BCO. Impaired glucose, uh, gestational diabetes during pregnancy, sometimes they develop even hypertension, and sometimes they have a small uh, gestational age. Infertility, when you're talking about infertility, it's a fraudulent uh, antrum impaired selection of dominant, and uh, the risk of multiple pregnancy is very high. Although they might have an infertility, when suddenly you treat them, you might end by multiple pregnancy. 75% of women uh, with anovulation due to infertility, uh, they lead to infertility. How can we uh, help them? I will say weight loss, as we mentioned, uh, lifestyle. Frequency of uh, obesity women, they are always have anovulation. Uh, six month weight loss program for uh, overweight, uh, make them ovulate. Uh, uh, and in, in a lot of studies, they say if, even if they f lose five to ten kilos of gram, uh, that will improve their uh, their fertility. Uh, Ninety percent resume ovulation, and eighty-five percent become pregnant. So, just weight loss can be helpful for this patient. Uh, if BMI is elevated, uh, loss of at least five percent of the body weight ovulation induction with clomiphene citrate or insulin sensitizer as a single agent. Uh, sometimes we, we have to use gonadotropin therapy. Sometimes you have to use gonadotropin therapy plus insulin sensitizer. Or sometimes patients, they don't get pregnant after four or five years and we have to go for uh, in vitro fertilization. And if we go to in vitro fertilization, Please, in BCO patient, do not uh, transfer more than one, one single uh, embryo because they tend to have multiple pregnancy like uh, twins and triplets and quadruplets. Uh, BCO stimulation cycle, BCA should often be respond to the medication. If they don't spill the medication to Clomid, you add FSH. They have high risk of uh, multiple pregnancy they have higher risk of high ovarian hyperstimulation, and this is why we usually uh, end by uh, single or maximum two embryo in patient with BCO. I think I, uh, this was my last slide, and uh, I think, uh, I hope I cover uh, in non-pregnant what is the treatment, in, non what in, in pregnancy what is the complication, and if they want to get pregnant, and maybe this is for uh, people who are interested in how uh, an, uh, a BCO patient can get pregnant uh, and if they reach to IVF, what they should do. Thank you very much, Jumaana. If you have any question, I'm, I'm ready to answer, if now or later, as uh,
your recommend. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, that was really uh, a, a very, uh, um, let's say, uh, you've shown us the, the experience or your experience through um, years of, of uh, management of such patients. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. I'm sure yeah, we'll have a lot of questions for you. Uh, I don't know whether going to, this will be uh, at the moment or later on uh, after uh, the other speakers uh, finish their, uh, their uh, lectures. So uh, as um, I was told, this will be, uh, inshallah, questions and answers will be uh, later after we finalize uh, the whole session. So our next speaker will be uh, uh, Dr. Yusuf Saleh, is a senior consultant of endocrinology and, 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 and diabetes in uh, King uh, Saud uh, University uh, for Medical Science of a health science. Uh, Dr. Saud is uh, well known in his uh, um, repeated uh, contribution uh, with our uh, Saudi Diabetes Society meetings. Uh, he is very active in the area of management of osteoporosis. And he will uh, address us tonight on the management of uh, osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. Uh, please. Uh, Dr. Yusuf. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. Masa al khair al jameer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khalid. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khalid, for the introduction. And I do thank the Saudi Society for Diabetes for the invitation. And uh, really, this is an exciting uh, program that we are uh, uh, attending these days with uh, video 20. Congratulations for the success. So my, the outline of my presentation, just a few words about FRAX, treatment options, and then a summary of recommendations will follow the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologist Guidelines published recently in 2020, uh, since I'm also chairing the Gulf chapter of the of American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. So fragility fractures are so common, and it will happen in one in th three women and, and one in five men over the age of 50 years, um, one fracture um, in the world at the moment is occurring every three seconds and they affect the quality of life by loss of functional uh, dependence, loss of uh, uh, mobility and increase in mortality. And they are also very costly to the healthcare system. If somebody develops a fracture and whether males or females, the solid line represents males and the dotted line represents females, so if they have a fracture, they will continue the risk to be uh, higher and higher with years to develop more fractures unless they are treated. Now, what is the epidemiology in the kingdom? Um, many studies have been published, uh, whether in the central region with the, uh, Allah Yerhamu, uh, Professor Mahmoud al who was the first to publish the first study of uh, um, the prevalence of osteoporosis in Saudi Arabia using um, single photon absorptiometry. And then he uh, did more studies in women uh, with uh, DEXA scanning. Uh, there is a group in the eastern part of the kingdom. And then the group of uh, our colleague and friend and mentor, Professor Saleh, Muhammad Saleh al in the western region, who published probably the largest study on the prevalence of osteoporosis in the kingdom. This is a systematic review um, that uh, concluded that uh, the prevalence overall is 34% in women aged 50 to, uh, to 80 years. And this is based on seven studies in females, uh, number exceeding 5,000 subjects, and the prevalence is 30.7% in men, and this is based on three studies in males. Now, these figures are probably uh, an estimate of the lump of these studies, while if you come to some individual studies, like the Professor Ardawi paper published uh, some years ago and uh, covering the Jidda area on 1,700 subjects, the prevalence was 46% in post menopausal women, which is quite common. Another publication looking at the cost of osteoporosis in the kingdom, 30 billion is the 
total annual cost. And the majority of this cost is because of hospitalization, 18.6 billion. And the rest is because of outpatient and nursing care. And this is again by Professor Ardawi in 2008. Now, for years, we did not have a solid system um, that we depend on as endocrinologists and specialists in bone disorders that we try to pick up high risk patients and treat them. And our colleagues in cardiology, for example, they enjoy the many of the scoring systems, whether Framingham uh, or whatever scoring system in div different countries, different societies, where you look at risk factors, you look at hypertension, diabetes, family history of premature coronary artery disease, lipid, smoking, and then you try to come up with a risk calculator and to decide who are the patient that you need to go aggressively with statins and antihypertensives and so on. So we're dependent only on the T-score. Uh, so DEXA scanning, anybody with a T-score of minus 2.5 or more is labeled as osteoporosis and treated immediately with uh, anti-resorptive or anabolic agent. And this is not correct because many of these patients, they are low risk patients. Uh, so till um, the WHO uh, came up with the lead of uh, Professor John Canis with the FRAX, the Fracture Risk Assessment, and briefly, this is a, a, a calculator that is based on uh, nine risk factors. And uh, every country is called to develop its own fracs based on the prevalence of, the, of hip fractures in particular and other fractures as secondary fractures and the cost of treatment in each country. So in the Middle East, if you go to fracs, fracture risk assessment, you just write fracs in Google or you enter uh, Sheffield University where Professor Canis used to be based, and you find the FRAX uh, risk assessment. Now it's available also in an in, in application. You can download it on your mobile and do FRAX on your patients in the clinic. So in the Middle East, we have these countries who developed their own FRAX. Lately, Abu Dhabi, and I'm saying Abu Dhabi, not the other parts of the Emirates, because they, depended, they were dependent on um, insurance data in Abu Dhabi, and they came up with Abu Dhabi FRAX. Iran, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon. Lebanon was the first in the area to come up with, with the FRAC system, Morocco, Palestine, and Tunisia. Palestine, they adopted the Jordanian uh, data. And I would like to announce that um, in the kingdom, we are uh, doing the FRAX project. And I just want to share with you the appearance of the data that we collected over two years in different regions, in Riyadh, Mecca, Jof, Tabuk, Damam, Najran, Hail, Al-Baha, and Jezan. Uh, so this is uh, the, some of the data that we got, we got. And this is a collaborative work between the Ministry of Health, the Saudi Osteoporosis Society, and um, a general support from Eli Lili, uh, independent grant from them, uh, where we collected data on hip fractures in various regions of the kingdom. And hopefully, in the couple of months, we will have the Saudi FRAX, inshallah. Now, in looking at FRAX cut limits in various regions, probably it doesn't matter what we use. So we don't have Saudi FRAX, you just use a surrogate country. And I think in the most uh, close to the kingdom is that of Abu Dhabi and Kuwait. Kuwait data are more solid. They depend on three years data collection of hip fractures in Kuwait. Um, and the cut limit for a treatment of major osteoporotic fracture or hip fracture is pretty the same between Abu Dhabi, Jordan, Kuwait, and Lebanon. Morocco and Tunisia, they have much lower rates of fractures and their readings are lower. So this is the latest guidelines on osteoporosis. The American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists published this year, and I call for you to have a look on them, very nicely written with the grades and level of evidence. And the... Uh, most important question that we always say, uh, face as specialists and when to treat patients with, uh, with, uh, for osteoporosis. So anybody, uh, and this is a disputed point. So in ACE, they said anybody with T-score minus 2.5 in the elbow, femoral, neck, total proximal fever or one third radius. And the problem of applying this in the kingdom is that we don't have our own reference range for normal BMD. So we are inserting in the DEXA scans, the softwares, various uh, data, like we're using mostly the enhanced uh, softwares. So we are comparing our densitometry of our patients to that of Americans. And probably we know that we definitely, we are different from Americans from this point of view of the 
size of the bone and strength of bone. And uh, comparing us to the Americans is just unsafe um, or unfair. Uh, there are some DEXA scans like what we use in National Guard. We brought the Lebanese software and we are using that in our hospital, considering that probably we are closer to Lebanese than the Americans. Um, so I, I think we have to be very cautious in adopting this recommendation in the kingdom and always run fracs for your patient. Low trauma fracture, regardless of a bone density. So if somebody with osteopenia and fracture a bone, fill a small trauma, um, measured as a fall from standing height, then this is osteoporosis, treat that patient and you don't need to have osteoporosis on the scan. If the patient is osteopenic, you do frac system. Uh, so uh, osteopenic and the fracture, this is again uh, osteoporosis. And if somebody is osteopenic and high frax reading, then that patient deserves to be treated. So I would say three major recommendations uh, that we need to follow to try to select our patients. We have our own guidelines, and we published this in 2015, the Saudi guidelines for osteoporosis. And in this guidelines, we try to cover most of the important questions, and we touched on various medications, how to diagnose and how to treat, and what are the recommendations are there. Uh, every patient with osteoporosis needs to have a um, check for vitamin D as one of the major tests that you need to do. So the basic labs are uh, vitamin D, calcium phosphate, probably TSH, and if there is any uh, suspicion, uh, a test for malabsorption, on, and 24-hour urine calcium to rule out hypercalciuria, which can be uh, present in a small percentage of patients. Uh, vitamin D, um, preferably, this is the ACE recommendation, 75 nanomol is the target or the preferred level in patients with osteoporosis, 30 nanograms. So if you want to convert from nanogram to nanomol, you multiply by 2.5. Um, supplementation, they recommend in the Americans 1,000 to 2,000. We think, based on studies done by Professor Daghri and our group and the, um, the chair for chronic biomarkers of chronic disease in King Saudi University in Riyadh, that we need a higher dose than this to maintain our D level um, uh, in the range of 75. Higher doses may be necessary in certain patients like obese, malabsorption patient, and transplant and certain ethnicities, definitely we fill into that certain ethnicities. Again, we have our own guidelines for vitamin D. So this is a consensus paper that we published in 2017 with um, SQ, the European Society for Economic Clinical Aspects of Osteoporosis, Osteoarthritis, and Musculoskeletal Diseases, where we have two experts, Gianni Brigister and Rene Rizzoli. And again, please look at this position paper. It covers most of the aspects of vitamin D in the kingdom. We also published the Gulf uh, GCC uh, report or consensus report on, um, on vitamin D. And this involved uh, many uh, accredited or was endorsed by several societies, um, uh, the, the Saudi uh, Endocrine Society, the uh, Emirates, the ACE Gulf chapter, um, and uh, Kuwait uh, Osteo Society and many other societies endorse these guidelines. And if you look at the names, they involve people from all of the GCC countries. So again, another paper that summarized to you how to diagnose, what are the tests, what are the proper testing and how to treat patients with vitamin D. Um, calcium need to be given to all patients with osteoporosis because for a postmenopausal female to have enough calcium, they need supplements, anything between 1,200, 1,500 per day, always with vitamin D and not alone. Pharmacological agent, we have uh, bisphosphonate, uh, bone resorption inhibitors, uh, bisphosphonate, raloxifene, and DMA, prolia. And we have only one anabolic agent, PTH or 4TO. This is the FIT trial for alindronate, where it showed clinical significant benefits uh, and reduction of uh, vertebral fractures, hip fracture, and wrist uh, fracture. We have alindronate once weekly. And this is IV uh, bisphosphonate, which is uh, Zometa, zoledronic acid, uh, given once a year. And it works beautifully, especially 16 weeks after the injection, you will find this nice separation between placebo and zoledronic acid once a year. So you have two options to give alindronate once a week and zoledronic acid once a year. You have to follow the compliance and uh, give the patient instruction how to use alindronate properly, empty stomach, nothing uh, half an hour after the, the uh, tablet, not to lie down, not to bend forward, 
and to drink it only with water, no, not juice or any other thing, and avoid it in certain patients with esophageal problems and gastric acidity. This is raloxifene, um, rarely if ever used, and it has effect only on vertebral fracture, 30% reduction, and does not reduce non-vertebral or hip fracture. So reserved for early postmenopausal years in patients who have only vertebral osteoporosis. So this is raloxifene. Now we have prolia, a subcutaneous injection, denosumab, uh, and this is a rank ligand inhibitor, so it's an antibody that prevents the attachment of rank to rank ligand, and that will decrease the formation of osteoclast. And this is the effect of prolia compared to placebo over three years. And this is the BMD reading, what happens to it after the injection. And look at the placebo after three years when they were shifted to prolia, the nice improvement in uh, densitometry. And we don't uh, depend on densitometry always. The surrogate point for any osteoporosis treatment is the reduction in fractures. And this is the effect in more than 7,000 women um, of uh, the effect on vertebral fractures, placebo versus denosumab, non-vertebral fractures, and hip fractures. And again, all of them were statistically significantly reduced with uh, brolia. And we have um, studied this medication, uh, studies on this medication for 10 years now, uh, which showed effect, and this is up to six years, but there are data on 10 years it showed continuous improvement of bone mineral density over 10 years of therapy. We have only one anabolic agent. This is tiriparatide, 20 microgram injection once a day. We give it to one and a half to two years, and then we stop therapy. This is the effect on uh, vertebral fracture reduction comparing placebo to 20 microgram of tiriparatide, the nice reduction in vertebral fractures. We, uh, the study was not powered enough to look at hip fractures, but if you look at non-vertebral fractures collectively, just touching significance. Um, and this is lumping uh, pelvic fractures, humeral fractures uh, with uh, the small number of hip fractures, uh, while the numbers were too small to judge on hip fractures. But many experts believe that it also decreases hip fractures. This is comparing tiriparatide as an anabolic agent with residronate as an anti-resorptive. And the difference is 52% difference in favor of less fractures with tiriparatide. And this is called the VERO trial, where they compared patients in the immediate post-fracture period, um, uh, looking at the effect of anti resorptive compared to anabolic. And definitely, uh, anabolics do much well. This is the effect on the cumulative incidence of clinical fractures altogether. Um, but if you look again at non-vertebral fractures, which include hips, um, residronate is much higher fracture refracturing compared to teriparatide. Um, we have another anabolic agent, not yet in the market, rumosuzumab, and this is a, a, an agent uh, which is anti-sclerostin. If you prevent sclerostin uh, from working, then you increase the formation of uh, osteoblast, and uh, you get anabolic effect. So these are the patients with placebo uh, compared to uh, rumosuzumab, the reduction in vertebral fractures. And if you look here on the um, the other side, so these patients, placebo compared to rumosuzumab, and then uh, the 12 months, another 12 months of treatment where these patients were shifted to denosumab. So this is placebo plus denosumab, and this is rumosuzumab followed by denosumab. And you can see the significant difference between the two groups. Marked reduction of fracture rate uh, if you start with anabolic and then continue with anti-resorptive in the form of denosumab. So when to use anabolic? A patient with at very high fracture risk, and this includes patients with recent fracture. So somebody who had a bad fracture, a bad hip fracture, within the past six, 12 months, probably starting with anabolic is not a bad idea. Fracture while on approved osteoporosis therapy. You give patient alindronate and they come back with a fracture, shift immediately to anabolic. Those with multiple fractures, you do a lateral X-ray, which I recommend to every patient with osteoporosis must have a lateral X-ray or if you have vertebral fracture assessment software on the DEXA machine, then order it, order lateral spine assessment where you can look at vertebral fractures, which can be silent. And I'm saying it's a must because some patients, they have a mild degree of, of, of osteoporosis and you, you do fracs and the, the fracs readings are low and you say, I will not treat this patient, even with a T-score of minus 2.7. Then you do a lateral X-ray spine and you find one or two or more vertebral collapses 
this is definitely a treatment um, recommended for such patient. So if somebody on steroid and fracture, then this is a patient that needs anabolic, very low two scales, my, a two score, minus three, minus 3.5, minus four, probably getting a patient on anabolic for one and a half years is uh, not um, um, a bad idea. And this is, by the way, the recommendation of ACE, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, those with very high fracture probability. So you do frax on your patient, you put the risk factors, you put the age, the height, and you press calculate, you, you put the T-score if you have them. And if you have a major osteoporotic fracture rate above 30%, hip fracture above 4.5, then um, uh, higher than these, higher than these readings. So these patients, they need to be anabolic. And uh, we're saying anabolic first because uh, you build up the bones. If you start an anterosorptive first, and then you try to add an anabolic after you stop anti-resorptive, then the effect is reduced. Uh, so the best way in high-risk patients start with anabolic for one and a half, two years, and then shift to anti-resorptive. How long a uh, patient should be treated? For bisphosphonate, oral bisphosphonate, five years. And this is based on the fracture long-term extension trial with, uh, with alindronate, where it showed that you get reduction only in clinical vertebral fractures. So those patients who come to the ER with back pain, you don't get reduction on of, of hip fracture, pelvic fractures, humeral fractures, and vertebral fractures, uh, silent vertebral fractures. And that's why after five years, you stop and you assess your patient. Uh, IV is hyaluronic acid, three doses. So three years, and then you stop treatment. Tiriparatide uh, or roloxifene may be used if you try to stop. Dr. Saleh, uh, we're a bit short of time, so if you can make it. Okay, just a few minutes, Dr. Khalid, I'm, I'm, I'm the last few slides. Thank you, thank you. Um, so tiriparatide, if you start to, 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 if the patient is high risk patient, uh, then you carry on with treatment. If you elect to stop, you can give another anti-resorptive or anabolic. A drug holiday is not recommended with denosumab because if you stop denosumab, the risk of vertebral fractures become high. So if you stop, put the patient on another therapy. Um, you can, combination therapy is not advisable. And uh, there are studies which looked at combination, for example, denosumab and triparatide, anti with anabolic, which showed excellent effect on BMD, but there are no fracture data and the side effect and the cost is, uh, again, negative points. Um, augmentation, vertebral augmentation, so kyphoplasty and other vertebroplasty are not recommended anymore. Uh, what is successful treatment if the patient uh, is maintained without fractures, BMD is increasing or stable, then that's successful therapy. If you have more uh, resorption markers, if they are continue to be suppressed, this is a successful therapy for anti-resorptive. If the bone formation markers are higher, then this is successful therapy for anabolic. Two more slides. Uh, patients are getting no treatment. So patients get admitted with their fractures and treated and discharged without proper uh, investigation, no DEXA scanning, no vitamin D, no calcium and no treatment for osteoporosis, only to come one or two years later with the fracture of the other hip or more vertebral fractures. This is a study and uh, a survey of 3,000 orthopedic surgeons. 90% of them do not routinely measure bone density, and 75% are lacking appropriate knowledge on osteoporosis. We looked at uh, treatment gap in our hospital in National Guard when we published this paper in 2019, where we found that the majority of patients admitted in National Guard Riyadh with hip fractures do not get proper treatment. We would not accept less than 20% secondary prevention after a heart attack. All of these patients with heart attack get proper secondary prevention with aspirin, uh, um, antithrombotic, uh, antistatins, sometimes aggressive uh, lipid lowering, antihypertensive, and so on. We don't do the same thing with our patients with fractures. So in summary, osteoporosis is a serious disease prevalent in GCC countries. Use FRAX on all your patients. Any patient with steps in your clinic even with a T-score of minus 2.7, 2.8, do FRAX. If it's quite low risk, do not treat that patient. So it's not only, you don't treat based on the BMD itself. And this is what we recommend in the Middle East till we get our normative data for Saudis. Vitamin D and calcium should be given to all patients, individualized therapy. There is no therapy that fits all. Sometimes I start the patient on anabolic. Another patient, I'll put him on anti-resorptive. You have to select the proper treatment for the proper patient. And the duration of treatment is dependent on the drug type. Uh, still, treatment gap is big, and we recommend doing fracture liaison service in hospitals, which admit lots of patients, especially with hip fractures, where a special nurse is trained 
to pick up these patients from the emergency department, from x-ray department in the ward with hip fractures, do a proper investigation, proper um, referral to uh, a spawn specialist and get proper treatment and proper follow-up after discharge. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Yusuf, for such uh, an excellent presentation, the management of uh, osteoporosis. Uh, because of time, uh, please stay with us until we uh, finish our, uh, uh, all the lectures, then we will have a session for discussion. So our next speaker is Prof. Abdurrahman uh, al-Sheikh. He is the uh, chairman of the Scientific Saudi Diabetes Society. He's a full professor of uh, internal medicine and, uh, and endocrinology in King Abdulaziz University uh, Hospital. He is probably one of the most active physicians now in the area of management of, of diabetes and uh, endocrine disease. We're pleased to have him with us tonight. Uh, Prof. Abdurrahman will be talking about the telemedicine, ethical challenges and patient uh, privacy and protection. Uh, Prof, welcome. Shukran Khalid, and thank you very much. And we thank all the members who shared with us. In the end, it was a great event, and it was a great event, and it was a great event. So thank you very much, and thank you very much. And we hope that you will be in the end of the day. Of course, tonight I have just to talk about uh, which is very important topic, especially this day. Uh, Uh, that create telemedicine challenges and ethical. So just uh, because this is because of COVID-19, uh, uh, most of uh, we have this uh, telemedicine uh, in our practice. And just to uh, take you for uh, most 15 minutes in the telemedicine challenges, what the problem we have in telemedicine and uh, the ethical issue uh, for the protection of our patients. Uh, I think we know this uh, date where the first uh, telephone been, been, been introduced uh, for the uh, distant uh, communication between the patient. Telemedicine, what we mean by telemedicine is the exchange of medical information from one location to another using electronic communication. It has multiple applications and can be used for different services, which include wireless tool, email, two-way video, we can use a smartphone now and other medical methods for telecommunication technology. For 40 years, telemedicine has been around globally and is still rapidly growing in the recent times. Honestly, it is not always possible to get a appointment with the doctors, with the patients, especially in the remote area. So the solution, it is the telemedicine. We used it in pandemic as we are what we are using now for our patients, following our patients. Remote, or, re, remote area where there is an availability of all the specialties. Dur during war, the hajj, during the Hajj also, there is also telemedicine being used. Second opinion for rare cases. Academic purpose to be discussed cases as academic uh, between the institutions also use the telemedicine. Easy communication and follow up between patients and their physicians, especially in chronic cases, chronic diseases, especially the, like diabetes, hypertension, following the reading of diabetes and between the patient and their doctors. And also uh, radiological reporting, not because the, now not all the hospital having the radiologist or uh, like the MRI readings uh, or taking second, second opinion of the radiology for reporting. So there is many uses for telemedicine. There is top five reasons to consider telemedicine. Better access and uh, reach to your physician, physician, cost effective, convenience, especially in, during these days, and millennial demand, millennial demand, and reduce the ab absence, absence, uh, absence of the patient. You can follow the patient, especially when they are not uh, willing to come to the hospital. It's improve access to care, and easy for the people with disability, improve access for all the adults uh, to follow them, especially in the geographically isolated who are not able to come to the hospital. Preventive care, easier to access and preventive care, especially cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, to prevent the complication of diabetes. 
slowing the spreading of the infection, especially these days. Patients with COVID uh, diseases or contact with COVID patients, not necessarily to come to the hospital, or those patients who is uh, likely or their immunity is not good, not necessarily to come to the hospital, so we can use the, the telemedicine. Convenience and uh, lower cost. Even the cost is lower than the patient coming to the hospital. Benefit for the health uh, provider, especially the hospital, is less exposure to the illness infection. As I mentioned, in the uh, patient with the COVID, and also reduce the overloaded in the hospital or over and the expense in the hospital. Patient satisfaction because he know that his doctor following him any time, and also additional uh, revenue stream can be used. And this is also uh, clinician may find that telemedicine supplements their income because might increase their income because if they follow the patient in regular basis. Disadvantage for patients, protection medical, and hackers. The problems of the hackers, not only the medical, it's they are criminal and may able to access patient medical data, especially if those patient access telemedicine on public network or via uh, an unsecured, unsecured channel. Uh, care delays, some of the patients may, might have some illness which need to be seen or to come to the hospital, especially the ischemic uh, cardiovascular disease like chest pain, and he's just depend on the telemedicine, not coming to the hospital to have the treatment like coronary angiography or coronary surgery. So sometimes there is a care delay and the patient might come after times to see his doctor. There is this advantage for health provider, technical concern. Not all the hospital has the technical or the good internet or good, good uh, facility to have the good uh, telecommunication and an ability to examine the patient. Some of the patients need to be examined. As I face these days, some of the patients, they will tell you that he has goiter. Goiter, sometimes you need to palpate the goiter. It is not necessary to, feel, to see by picture that he has swelling. The palpation of the swelling is very important in the examination. So sometimes it's a very um, unable to examine or to decide what the patient has, what types of the tumor. So there is many barriers to community medicine. It is uh, malpractice, um, up to 60%, re-embarrassment up to 43%, technical problems, and this is what we face, uh, especially with the internet. Privacy, there is a problem, especially between the hagar and the, among the patients also, not sure the diagnosis by the telemedicine, we are not definitely sure, especially in certain diseases. Many physicians don't offer telemedicine, maybe the patient doesn't like the telemedicine, or he has no practice in telemedicine, concerned about the insurance. And even now, the insurance company all agreed for the telemedicine and they cover the cost for telemedicine. And the privacy, another issue. With increasing of the prevalence or of the situation now as COVID telemedicine has bumped up this uh, the telemedicine and, ma and management through the telemedicine and camera to expose patients has uh, and health professional from contracting the coronavirus infection by, uh, and we have different uh, scenario uh, where we can use now the telemedicine uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. A patient with mild respiratory symptoms need evaluation, but has been told not to go to the emergency. So he has mild symptoms, he can contact the doctor and explain his symptoms. Patient has no symptoms of COVID, but have contact with someone with infected by the novel coronavirus and want to be evaluated. This is another story. A patient needs care for and related reason, management of chronic health condition like diabetes, like ischemic heart disease, and due to the clinic closure or because of corona, he can uh, contact his physician and follow his case. Provider, a provider has been guaranteed that some patients, some of our colleagues, infected or he contacted with coronavirus and he's isolated in the hotel or at his home. So he can contact his patient by telemedicine and he follow his patient. A patient with severe symptoms of COVID-19 is hospitalized and need a special, uh, other specialty to like diabetes to follow him. So he can follow the patient who has been in the hospital with severe COVID without coming or seeing the patient even by the covid I mean by the telemedicine and you can follow and can take another opinion from the other specialty. So telemedicine software also enable patient to communicate via online chat 
or audio or video call with virtual physician or clinical staff regarding their signs and symptoms instead of being physically present in the hospital. And this is uh, information of the health and uh, keeping the health professional attending of the patient by making more uh, caution against contracting COVID-19 from the patient. So they can follow the patient, they can see the patient even with COVID without uh, spreading the infection between the uh, health professional. Moreover, the recent trend of corona patients uh, uh, all around telemedicine has also started becoming uh, available. And as I mentioned, that uh, all the insurance company now, uh, they agree to pay for the telemedicine and pay the uh, cost for the patient if seen even by the virtual clinic or by the telemedicine. And it is very, uh, they, they pay for all the costs. So telemedicine is a positive and evolving medical treatment option and study regarding telemedicine working so that the method can save time, money, and lives of the patients and even prevent the uh, chronic diseases so for complication, especially diabetes. If you follow their blood glucose and follow the monitoring of blood glucose, you can prevent the complication of uh, diabetes. So what we have, the challenges, we have connectivity, sometimes a problem. Video image has not the same quality as when you see it in, the, in front of you. Low bandwidth, cost instability, there is no cost, standard cost, uh, and need a healthcare professional with computer and technology, ethical issue. And this is another issue which is very important, ethical issue, language, sometimes language barrier. Uh, infrastructure should be developed for the uh, telemedicine, high resolution camera, we should use it. And I think this is available with most of the physician now with a smart uh, phone. Uh, and we have to have ethical, um, we have to have ethical issues and we have to uh, stand to it and we have to follow it. And the cost should be standardized uh, from the Minister of Health and training facility should be available and should be motivated. All the workshops, uh, and we have workshops for that, and camps for the telemedicine, and we have to be motivated. What about the ethics in telemedicine? The ethics and the ethical practice in telemedicine, all physicians who practice telehealth or telemedicine has an ethical responsibility to uphold fundamental, and uh, they have to follow the, all the code of the ethical, of the medical ethics. They have to follow the code and place welfare of the patient in the, the beginning and should be the top, provide competent care, provide information, patient need to make well-considered decision about care. And they have to put the patient up to the, their priority and to care about their patient and to give the right treatment for their patient should be in the top of the priorities, their priorities. Respect patient privacy and should be respected and not to spread the information or the history or the examination of the patient and should be confidential. Take steps to ensure continuity of the care. You have to follow the patient and you have to have the continuity of the care. Uh, professionalism should be available all the time and follow relevant ethical guidelines, should have ethical guidelines in each institute. And I think the minister is responsible about the uh, ethical guidelines to be for the telemedicine and should be in the uh, for it, uh, 100 and uh, in contents of telemedicine should be proficient and to use technology. We have to learn how to use the technology to follow the patient and we should recognize our limitation, especially in the radiological issue. So we have to have our guidelines for the ethical and we have to follow it. Disclose, manage, elim eliminate financial problem and or any conflict of the interest. And not only for the money wise, or the cost wise should be our aim mainly for giving care for our patients, uh, either having the COVID or his contact with COVID or any disease which can be used for treatment and follow up. Provide objective and accurate information, set the protocol to protect and secure patient information. When attending to a person or individual health request, inform about limitation, should your limitation, especially in the center, small center where they're not all your uh, uh, facility available, you have to set your uh, limitation and should be clear for all the patients. Advice how to arrange for needed care and follow up and you have to explain for the patient if he has any illness and need to come to the hospital should be very clearly 
explained for the patient and they have to come to the hospital if they have diseases or complications cannot be followed and cannot be treated through the telemedicine or by telephone. Consider how information can be preserved and access for future follow-up care should uh, for follow-up as, as what we have in our uh, files and documentation in the hospital through the professional organization and institution support the technology and develop implement standard for safety at care and should be secured from the hackers not to take any information of the patient and routinely monitor telemedicine landscape and identify address uh, consequences and identify the disseminate outcome, positive or negative, what the positive from the telemedicine, what the negative, and we have to improve the negative issue to have good telemedicine. And I think telemedicine, if not, will be continue, not only during this pandemic, I think it will be continue, and for even for the other diseases, like the chronic diseases, diabetes, and chronic uh, illness, hypertension, or chronic heart disease. At this uh, point, I will uh, thanks all of you and thanks for your uh, uh, attention and uh, thanks for all of our colleagues. And I think it's uh, telemedicine now. It's very important for us to follow our patients and to feel easy that we have our patients between our hands and we can follow them any times and even them, they can follow us any time. Thanks for Dr. Khal. Thanks for all of our colleagues. Uh, thank you, Professor Abdurrahman, uh, for enlightening the importance of telemedicine, which is, I think is, uh, is a crucial now, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, I'm sorry, but because of time, uh, I'm going to present our last speaker, uh, Dr. Saeed Khadr. He's a, a colleague, a well-known uh, physician, consultant, uh, endocrinologist, and Suleiman Al-Habib uh, Hospital in Riyadh. And he will be talking about the uh, use of sulfonylureas in the management of type 2 diabetes. Uh, please, Dr. Yusuf. Dr. Saeed. Okay. Dr. Saeed. Just, yeah, okay. Okay. Assalamu First, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to give this virtual lecture, and I would like to thank Dr. Khaled, the chairman, and my colleague, the previous speakers, who gave an excellent lecture. Certainly, my job now is difficult. I'm the last speaker to defend the poor oral hypoglycemic agent the very old one, sulfonylurea, in management of type 2 diabetes. I mean, certainly when we choose the drug, we have to understand the pathophysiology of diabetes. And um, Dr. Khaled, Dr. Uh, uh, Abdurrahman, and Dr. Yusuf will agree with me that sulfonylurea is one of the old medications that we've been used. And I remember probably 30 years ago, there was nothing about it from glibeniglimide and metformin and insulin at that time, there was, I used the pork insulin and beef insulin. But now we understand that diabetes is not just a beta cell problem, but certainly still there is a place for sulfonylurea in spite we have too many medications these days. 
And I can bet anybody to say that I don't use sulfonylurea. All of us, any diabetologist, most of the healthcare provider who treat type 2 diabetes, he is using sulfonylurea and is still the most prescribed oral hypoglycemic agent anywhere in the world is sulfonylurea. It is fantastic to understand the pathophysiology of diabetes, and I agree totally that now the guidelines insist that we have to individualize patients who have atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, for example, to be on metformin and then choose those with GLB-1 receptor agonist or SGL-2 inhibitor, etc., which is very important because of the benefit the cardiovascular outcome trial. But in spite of this medication, it's still we are not reaching the target. Not only this, nobody speak about sulfonylurea in spite that sulfonylurea has been used for a long time and it's in all the studies, the biggest studies that they use the new antihyperglycemia, they still use sulfonylurea and they didn't remove it from the biggest studies. And this is the pancreas here, the, just to remind you with the beta cell, alpha cell, etc. And sulfonylurea is not just one drug. Each drug is different in the structure and the mechanism of action. And if you look here, that eclipizide is different from the glibiniclamide, different from eclipizide, different from glibiride regarding the structure. The other things regarding the mechanism, the new generation of sulfonylurea, for example, the eclipizide that here stop the potassium ATP channel and then allow the calcium to influx here and then to insulin granulocyte exercise sources to secrete insulin. The most important thing is that eclipizide is different if other medication, other sulfonyl, that it didn't work on something called impact 2 which is important. We know that there is guidelines. Everybody is love the guidelines. Everybody speak about the new generate the new medication, which is fantastic. I agree if we individualize, and usually they put sulfonylurea at the bottom, okay? When you use SGL2 inhibitor, uh, GLB1 receptor agonist, metformin, TZDs, DDB4, then at the end you have to use sulfonylurea. And because diabetes, patients live with diabetes for years and years, at one stage we have to consider sulfonylurea, and sometimes in certain countries we use it as second line or first line because of the cost effective. And this is, if you are considering the cost, it is important to consider sulfonylurea. If you are in India or Indonesia, if you are in Palestine or Jordan, after metformin, I'm going to use sulfonylurea, not as GL2 inhibitor or GLB1 receptor agonist, unless the patient have an established atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease, I have to convince the patient of the benefit and ask him to pay more money. The other thing, for example, this is the consensus if from those living in Asia, okay, and this is published in Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Those in, in Southeast Asia, okay, their society there, what they said about sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea is an effective, safe drug, well tolerated, and been in the market more than 50 or 60 years. And I said, every one of us treating diabetes have a good experience with sulfonylurea. We never face any problem. We never find any side effect to this drug. It's very effective is very safe and I didn't see anybody ever blame sulfonylurea that it caused death or affect the heart or any organ in the body but we have to choose the right dose the right medication the right sulfonylurea to the right patient and modern sulfonylurea is important as I showed you that each sulfonylurea is different from the other the structure and the mechanism okay as healthcare provider, wherever you work, what you want from anti hyperglycemic agent? Not only just to improve the cardiovascular or macrovascular, we have also to achieve a target. All the bodies, all the guidelines in the world will say we need an HB1C, for example, less than seven. And this new medication never achieved it. So we need to say if this sulfonyl, is it effective? Is it durable? patient tolerate, is it safe, the cost, and also now they are speaking about personalized therapy by phenotype and genotype, because some patients, they respond well to certain drugs because of their phenotype, they don't respond to this drug. For example, some patients, they respond depending on the gene to metformin if they have certain things in their body. Okay, I'm going to go in details, and it's important. Patients with Moody, for example, maturity once in diabetes in young, they respond very well to sulfonylurea. There are certain ethnicity, they respond better to metformin than the others. So the question is, do we still need sulfonylurea? 
Is glycemic efficacy control and stable and sustainable? Is it important? Everybody will say yes. It is very important to achieve a good control and to give a medication with no side effect and durable. Do sulfonylureas still have a place in the clinical practice? I will probably show you yes. And I'm happy after the end of the lecture to somebody say that I don't use sulfonylurea or I don't need it or we need to withdraw it from all guidelines. As you know that sulfonylurea is the most effective drug in lowering the blood sugar after insulin. And it can lower the blood sugar by more than 2% and we have good experience with it. Is it really modern sulfonylurea? Is it dangerous or being wrongly accused? Everybody speak, oh, we don't need sulfonylurea. Because sulfonylurea causes hypoglycemia. But nobody ever said that sulfonylurea will give you heart failure or mortality. There was only one study called university, a group study, and that time in the 70s, they used all butamide and been withdrawn from the market, but nothing else. These big studies here, for example, they examine outcome trial, they did before, 46% of those in the trial patient, they are on sulfonylurea. Why they didn't remove it? In several study, again, 40% of those 16,000 patients still on sulfonylurea. In TCOS study, the same, they kept patient on sulfonylurea. Come to the SGL2 inhibitor. Imbaric study, the outcome, fantastic. Everybody spoke about the Imba. Where is the 48% of those patients they're still in sulfonylurea? Why they didn't stop it? In CANVAS study, again, they are on sulfonylurea. 50% of those patients, in reality, they're still taking sulfonylurea, even in the declared outcome trial. So sulfonylurea is not harmful. It is effective. It lowers the blood sugar. GLP-1 receptor agonist, take leader study. 60% of the 9,000 patients, they're still in sulfonylurea, okay? So basically, a sustained study, the leader outcome trial, all of them, they're still on sulfonylurea. One in two patients of those being randomized to this expensive drug, which is fantastic, is still on sulfonylurea. So up to now, sulfonylurea being in every single study being conducted for the cardiovascular outcome trial. Yes, we know that, for example, if you come to DDB4, we have to be careful from one of the DDB4, for example, SEXA, the worried about heart failure, it might cause irritable bowel syndrome, SGL2 inhibitor, we are worried in certain patients about DKA, or in one of the studies in the CADFAS amputation, GLB1 receptor agonist, you have to worry about thyroid cell carcinoma, etc. So it's important that they have side effect and these things we have to remember that sulfonylurea is very safe. Do newer agent load lead to a better control and improved safety? We'll come to that. Certainly, as you know, in spite we are using the new, we are using a GL2 inhibitor, GL2 receptor, biglutin, all of them up to now we didn't reach the target. So therapy changes are not translated into better control. Come next. What about all these studies, the randomized controlled study, the biggest studies, the only one study, the advanced study that reflects the reality of the patient that we see in a clinical practice. The others, they just design it to suit certain patients, a lot of exclusion, only advanced 35% real patient that we see in our clinical practice. So certainly, the, as we said here, that insulin and sulfonylurea is the more effective a drug as effective and lowering fasting, both bandel and HbA1c. Is, it, is there any study to defend that? And all of you will always refer, we always refer to UKBDS study. Every single lecturer, wherever you go, anywhere in the world, UKBDS study. And this is about the metabolic memory, okay, the, uh, the metabolic memory or the legacy. In 1997, they presented the study, and that, at that time, in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, being treated by metformin and glibinoglimide and insulin, nothing else, and they have benefit at least in the microvascular complication and probably non-statistically significant, even decrease in myocardial infarction. After 10 years, after 30 years, those patients being in sulfur area, they still have benefit and no side effect. Any reduction in HbA1c, if we didn't achieve it by using the new medication, certainly any reduction will help in decreasing microvascular complication. Okay, comparing, again, this is a study called Carolina study. I'm not going to go in details because of the time. It showed that there is no differences between glimibiride and DDB4, and here, the trajinta, lenagliptin, and it is safe. 
the cardiovascular outcome trial they are studying is it safe yes it is safe glimibiride didn't show any side effect or any harm to the to the cardiovascular and probably just a slight hypoglycemia those patients being randomized they had established cardiovascular disease 42 percent of them there is high risk uh, type 2 diabetes some of them are duration less than five okay and they are some of them treatment naive some of them on metformin but displayed at least two or three cardiovascular and glimibiride didn't show any and this is sulfonylurea any side effect it come to the advanced study use the Kittler's idea more than 11,000 patients being randomized again we're not going to go in details and it showed that this sulfonylurea and here clicklazide type 2 diabetes age 52 or older additional they have cardiovascular risk they are 65. They have major uh, microvascular, history of major microvascular, first diagnosis of diabetes more than 10 years prior to injury, and other major risk factors. So they are risky. They have an established risk factor for the cardiovascular disease. And again, we're not going to go in details regarding the study design. They are randomized to either uh, cliclazide or placebo in top of other medication. What they found from the advanced study, and I'm sure this is a landmark study after this study, good number, more than 11,000, it showed that the majority of patients, 81% of those patients being randomized to cliclazide MR, it dropped their HB1C to 6.5%. So it's very effective. The other things, again, this is in the American Diabetes Association being presented by Simon Hiller in year 2009. It showed that there is no a new or worsening nephropathy, there was significant reduction by 21%. And again, regarding the retinopathy, just 5% and microvascular in total 14%. And it is safe. It didn't show any increase in mortality or any harm to the heart. Regarding hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia is an itrogenic. We induce hypoglycemia by giving certain medication. If I choose the right dose to the right patient, and take history and education, I can avoid hypoglycemia with the new generation. As I said, for example, cliclazide, the mechanism is different from other sulfonylurea. Here in the advanced study, only 0.7% showed hypoglycemia comparing to 1.4% in Eucubides or after the study with a question mark because they are different population and they need the HP1C to be less than six. But certainly it's very low. What about in Ramadan? And I'm sure there was other studies, but the study done by Saud, Saud Sifri, again, it didn't show any significant hypoglycemia. This is a recent study by Muhammad Hassanin called Daya Ramadan, okay? It is an international real world study assessing safety and effectiveness of cliclazide MR60 during fasting Ramadan. And this is the inclusion criteria, which is type 2 diabetes aged more than 18. They have uh, suboptimal HbA1c, etc. okay? And they randomized pre-Ramadan, pre during Ramadan and after Ramadan. And what they found here, Okay, good randomization. And those patients, again, real life from the Middle East and from Asia, and uh, their age around 54, and they have, they are overweight, HB1C 7.5, and fasting blood sugar 140, etc. And they have established cardiovascular disease in 6.3% of them. They have hypertension 35 and dyslipidemia. So what they found here, is it showing any severe hypoglycemia or any harm? No severe hypoglycemia during the study. In a pre-Ramadan here, 0.2% and at least severe hypoglycemia, 0%. They summarize it. Again, there is no need to show all the slides. That summary of this Daya Ramadan, which is a fantastic study, good number of patients, pre-Ramadan, during Ramadan, and post-Ramadan, what they found? Symptomatic hypoglycemia was 2.2%, so it is safer than insulin. Confirmed hypoglycemia, only 1.6%. There was significant drop in the HB1C by 0.3%. Fasting blood sugar, significant drop by 97 again. And it didn't increase weight. In fact, there was a slight reduction by 05 Kilogram. So there is no severe hypoglycemia, no weight gain. It is safe for the heart. In fact, it might help. It might prevent some sort of cardiovascular problem. 
What about the nephropathy, which is important? So we have not to forget the microvascular and the nephropathy. The advance on the study is still after, because the advance up to six years, even when there is after 10 years they followed the patient, there was significant reduction. Five years follow up after the giving MRI, after they finished the advance, there was significant reduction by 46 percent. So it is nephroprotective, which is very good. Again, the long-term benefit of intensive glucose control for prevention in this stage renal disease, again, it was significant using the cliclazide, and it stopped worsening the chronic kidney disease by sometimes up to 66% relative risk reduction. So in conclusion, although I'm trying to defend this old medication, as I said, it is safe. We've been using sulfonylurea for more than 60 years. There is no single healthcare provider Treating diabetes, not using metformin, we have good experience. We never face any problem with it. I'm not saying to have to be on the top. You have used guidelines, metformin, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease patient. You should use GLB-1, SGL-2. We have to benefit from those drugs, but not to forget sulfonylurea. The advances study showed that there is no significant hypoglycemia and there is good nephroprotective. That's relative risk reduction by 21%. It also shows 14% reduction in the microvascular complication. Even the advance on study around 10 years, again, it showed significant reduction and the prevention to end stage renal disease. Okay, mortality. Is there any really anybody died from sulfonylurea? They did a lot of systematic review and network meta-analysis, a huge number of patients. Again, if you look here, the cardiovascular mortality, in fact, it might be a protective, okay, in favor of a cliclazide, as I said. Again, here, all cause mortality. It's only probably chlorobromide, which we don't use at all. Butamide, glibinoglimide, it's okay. It's not uh, safe. Glimibiride, but cliclazide, it might prevent cardiovascular death. And it might be as good as cardioprotective. It's not as good as GLB or SGL2 inhibitor. And this is meta-analyzed of more than 167,000 patients. So in conclusion, in a clinical practice, there are patients with type 2 diabetes who have survived even for 50 or 60 years after their type 2 diagnosis, and probably me, Dr. Khaled, whatever, we treated those patients for the, more than 20 or 30 years, and they're still on sulfonylurea. We still use it. It is good, tolerable, safe. Nobody ever complain of anything. Very rare to see allergy or GI side effect. It is too early to consider not using sulfonylurea and metformin because they still do have a place in therapy. Because all the guidelines, wherever you go, every year we wait, are they going to say stop sulfonyl? No, in fact, they're still using in the major big trials. All cardiovascular outcome trial, they're still having sulfonyl. These drugs are perhaps the only ones affordable by the majority of patients in developing countries. We should not, we have money here. You have money in Europe or in the state. But even in, in the UK, you cannot use SGL2 inhibitor to everybody or GLB1 receptor agonist because it is, it, it, it is expensive. We still use sulfonylurea. The newer drugs are useful. It is fantastic, particularly for a specific indication, as I said, those will need to have a benefit, cardiovascular benefit, yes. We have to follow the guidelines. It depends on the money. But I still believe that sulfonylurea will be on the menu in type 2 diabetes management probably for the next 10, 15 years coming. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Saeed, uh, for reminding us and expressing the uh, benefits of, of the use of uh, sulfonylurea and the management of, of, of type 2 diabetes. I'd like also to thank all the other speakers and, and, and the uh, audience. Uh, we start the discussion. We have some questions. And we start by uh, Prof. Hassan Abdujabbar. Uh, Prof. Hassan, yes. we got uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, somebody is asking, uh, can contraceptives cure the polycystic uh, ovary patients ovarian, uh, with olipus and, and, and uh, what about the use of other drugs like bioglitazone in, in, in such patients? Yeah, but uh, all, uh, any kind of contraception is, is okay, any kind. Even uh, 
even uh, the nova ring which has very small uh, uh, small percentage of hormone but once you know that it's block and inhibit ovulation this means that the hormone will go down unfortunately uh, uh, the other medication the only only progesterone for example it has different action not only uh, induction uh, ovulation suppression so it might not be as useful as uh, oral contraceptives. Uh, some people use the patches. The patches is, uh, contain estrogen and progesterone, and it inhibits the ovulation, and it's uh, as effective as oral contraception. Uh, what is the medication you mentioned? Yeah, well, well somebody was, was saying that uh, these patients could be managed by baglitazone or sometimes even by metformin. So what, what do you think yes, about study, that? Uh, all the studies showed that uh, metformin alone uh, can uh, resume uh, the regularity of the period uh, and uh, making the, the ovary uh, work nicely in only 40 to 50% of the time. But is it, it's good and effective with the contraception. Both together, they can, uh, can do the job. Yeah, and obviously these drugs will be working on the insulin sensitivity in these in, in these patients. Yeah. So they, they cannot be used alone. So we have we alone. Have to, no, they uh, cannot be used alone. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yeah. Um, well. Doctor Yusuf, I got a question for you. The uh, uh, prolonged usage of metformin or insulin injection can lead patients to osteoporosis. Can this lead to osteoporosis, the prolonged use of metformin or insulin? Actually, uh, it's, not, it's not the medications, but diabetes by itself is a risk factor for osteoporosis. This has been shown by many studies where the high blood sugar, uh, as you know, the formation of advanced glycation end products, and these um, glycation end products, they, they affect the bone tissue. And uh, for years, we know that uh, patients who, uh, with diabetes are at more risk of fracture. And in fact, in the, uh, uh, the, the IOF uh, and WHO and the subsequent FRAX versions, uh, they are going to incorporate diabetes as one of the risk factors, risk uh, factors that are put in the FRAX score system. So what, what some uh, experts recommend, like David Kindler, our colleague from, and friend from Canada, is um, uh, to when you have diabetes, you click on rheumatoid arthritis in the in the, uh, in the FRAC software. So you have the risk factor written, and there is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we, diabetes is not there anymore, but click yes on rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and this is just to uh, have something as close as a risk for for uh, for fractures as uh, diabetes. So definitely, diabetes by itself predisposed to fracture and osteoporosis. And not the medication. If anything, insulin is an anabolic agent, so probably it will build up tissues and maybe bone, um, but will not cause osteoporosis. And metformin, I'm not aware about any reports that metformin causes osteoporosis. We know bioglitazone and the glitazones in general they they increase the risk of fractures in postmenopausal women, and that's why postmenopausal women with osteoporosis should not receive bioglitazone uh, or uh, Rosiglitazone, rosiglitazone not, not available anymore, but at least bioglitazone is contraindicated in postmenopausal women with low density. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question for you. Do you consider the lowest or the total lumbar score? Which one are you? Uh, no, there are some reports which tell you that uh, L4, for example, is osteoporotic, and that's no. not appropriate. You should consider L1 to L4 score, not an individual. Uh, vertebral score. So and score. Okay. At this point, we try to emphasize to radiologists and nuclear medicine who reads uh, DEXA scanning that please do not report on individual vertebrae. You report on on the whole vertebral uh, bodies, lumbar vertebral bodies. Okay. Uh, maybe there is one other question. Uh, do you advise to use the lateral lumbar T score for patient with osteoporosis or osteophytes? and how we assess accuracy of the score of lateral view, especially with regard to outlining the vertebral bodies. No, so please let, let me clarify this very well. 
I did not say lateral X-ray view for scanning. I said uh, lateral fractures. X-ray of lateral X-ray spine, regular X-ray to look at fractures, vertebral collapses. Uh, uh, many patients they have silent fractures. You don't you don't pick them up. They don't feel pain, and you do uh, lateral X-ray spine to to pick up these what we call the morphometric vertebral fractures. Um, but uh, but scanning is done on the AB view on the DEXA scan the machine, not the lateral. There are some machines which has a software that allows you to look at the lateral spine X-ray. So you don't need to send the patient to the X-ray department to have lateral X-ray spine. It's called vertebral fracture assessment. So it gives you the morphology of the spine in the DEXA machine. Um, but but you need to insert the software to get that uh, VFA assessment. And it's a very beautiful uh, picture for the uh, lumbar spine. And it shows you if there is uh, there are any collapses, any vertebral collapses. So uh, I'm requesting lateral X-ray spine to look at vertebral collapses, not not DEXA scanning. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. It was nice to have you with us tonight. Now, uh, Prof. Abdurrahman, um, a question for you, please. Do you think telemedicine and virtual clinics can replace the normal clinic settings? In certain diseases, for follow-up of chronic cases, for uh, reporting X-ray, for certain diseases, yes, but not replace the actual uh, clinic. And uh, as been reported in one study that the cardiac disease is getting less in the hospital in one of the Europe country, but uh, this increase at home of cardiac, due to the cardiac diseases because of fear from the COVID not coming to the hospital. But, uh, but actually, uh, it is very helpful, especially as I mentioned in pandemic and uh, following the cases, especially chronic cases, but it will never replace the actual clinic. So how about clinical examination? How could be, how can we... This is one of the uh, fault of the, you cannot, especially uh, when I, now I face some of the patients, they tell I have swelling in my neck. What they can do, yeah, swelling in your neck, it's a different cause, you have to palpate. So this will not replace. There is, a, there is a, I saw some, uh, some technical things where you can listen, even to the, there is certain status quo, which being recognized by the FDA. They put it in the chest, you can listen, you can hear the, uh, breathing sound, and you can uh, put it in the heart, they hear the uh, murmur, if there is murmur. But palpation, I think, still, you need to palpate the patient. Uh, not like in the American and Canada style, for any patient they send for neck swelling, you go for X-ray, for ultrasound. For But I think uh, still examination and palpate the patient for certain uh, uh, telemedicine is very beneficial for following the cases where you know your case, or in, like now, what we have in COVID, where the patient with COVID or with symptoms suggest of COVID, not necessarily to go to the to bed his infection in the hospital, or those patients with chronic illness, not to come and get infection from the hospital, you can follow them. But you cannot take it as a, for, uh, for uh, forever, replacing that. But I think it will continue for certain diseases. Yeah, anyway, after the pandemic, the, the telemedicine, it will continue. And I think telemedicine is not only used for this time. It's been used for long, used for long time, especially for reporting the X-ray, especially in remote area. Now the ophthalmology, they can follow the cases from Arar. They can just picture the retina and send it to any highly specialized doctor in big cities. And uh, following our diabetic patients, we used to follow our diabetic patients uh, by email, the result or by the uh, what's up? So it's, we have we have this telemedicine for a long time. It will continue, but it will not replace the actual clinic. No, I, I I definitely uh, agree with you, uh, but maybe we don't know what future will come up. Maybe in the yeah, maybe so it's, uh, they have a stethoscope, <laughs> something to palpate, and uh, there is a Microsoft where yeah. you can feel the palpation, and I saw that ultrasound can be done. Uh, ultrasound can be done at the uh, remote area and you uh -huh. can and now there is the HTC they got um, certain equipment where they can have it uh, send it to the patient they can uh, take pictures x-ray and send it by uh, to the doctor and ECG, ECG and yeah. ECG and listen yeah. to that so all this it's very it's very expensive by the way this yeah. uh, the STC now they introduce it might be available in our country and uh, months uh, it will be, but this you have to have a certain hospital institution and to be given for the patient as a rent. 
those patients with, uh, with, uh, who are not able to follow their doctor in the hospital. But uh, I don't know, really, in the future, maybe there is something which will be make our life easy and to replace the bell patient, but still the bell patient and feeling the patient. And even the story, the history, history of the patient, which is very important part of the uh, reaching to the diagnosis. The history by telephone, by telemedicine is not the same as the history. It is, you see that uh, what we are seeing now, I'm seeing patients by the telephone, by the virtual clinic, following them. But really, the history is not different. When you feel the patient in front of you, not the same as when you feel just to call the patient and just uh, talking to them for their, uh, their problems. And uh, it's uh, definitely different. But this is something which helps us now to follow our patient in Hajj. They use it for Hajj. There is a report where they go and examine the patient as a doctor, examine, listen, and they send it to the doctor where they can interpret the ECG and the sound in the chest. And uh, it helps the people in the, in the, where you cannot have all the speciality in uh, this area. So it helps some patients, but I'm sure it's not replacing. Future-wise, I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, that's <coughs> all clear. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, now our colleague, Dr. Saeed. Uh, Dr. Saeed, again, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first question somebody is asking, uh, can we combine sulfonylureas with GLB or SGLT2? Yes, sulfonylurea, you can combine it with all antihyperglycemic agents in the market. You can combine it even with insulin, but you have to be careful with the hypoglycemia. Probably you need to decrease the dose. As I said, the only side effect of sulfonylurea is, is hypoglycemia. It's itrogenic. We induce it. It is called anti-hyperglycemia. Oral hypoglycemic agent. If I give the right dose, the right sulfonylurea to the right patient, avoid giving to elderly, demented people, or they are taking other medication that interfere or enhance uh, the hypoglycemia, then it would be okay. You can use it with SGL2 inhibitor, GLB1 receptor agonist. In fact, all these big trials, the cardiovascular outcome trials, as I showed you very clear, 50% of those patients randomized to these expensive, fantastic drugs, they're still taking sulfonylurea. And the other question was uh, when to use it in, in, in patients with type 2 diabetes. You can use sulfonylurea after metformin. If they couldn't tolerate metformin, you can use it as naive, in patient naive. I have no money. I have only few reals. You can buy sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea, you can use it as monotherapy, which is fantastic, well tolerated, safe. Just educate the patient. Don't increase the dose. Give the right dose to the right patient. I keep saying this. Very important. I never worried about hypoglycemia in sulfonylurea when I my cell when I give it the right dose. I start, for example, clitoris. I might start 30 milligram. Might start 120. Let me be right, I start one milligram. The patient may be sensitive because we don't know yet the phenotype and genotype. So we have to be careful, titrate it gradually. And you can use it after metformin, you can use it after GLB-1 or SGL-2 or DDB-4 if you are not achieving the target. Well, thank you. I would like uh, now to thank all the uh, speakers, uh, Professor uh, Hassan, uh, Dr. Yusuf Saleh, uh, Professor Abdurrahman and Dr. Saeed. Uh, thank you all thank you. for your time. Uh, I'm sure you've done a great job and, and, and I'm sure all the audience have enjoyed your, uh, your presence with us tonight. I'd like also to thank the Saudi Diabetes Scientific Society and uh, also all the people who are uh, working with us uh, tonight to uh, help those uh, who cannot uh, now uh, join us uh, to hear us and to hear from you all these uh, brilliant uh, lectures you gave us uh, tonight. Thank you, everybody, and uh, I hope to see you again, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.